Good morning. <laughs> so, yeah, I love having an active crowd over here. That's wonderful. <laughs> uh, so you're going to see the first thing that you're going to see in your bulletin insert that I put in there for the sermon, the sermon outline. There's a line that says, if only I had, and then there's a great big long blank spot. That blank is for you to fill in. You put anything there. I mean, whatever the first thing that comes to your mind, if only I had whatever, you can, again, it's anything, a new car, a wife, a house, more time, less work, you know, any of these things, less responsibilities, better neighbors. Put something in that line. And I'll just say now that there is no wrong answer, whatever's there, it's not a wrong answer. It's something that you desire, right? So it can't be a wrong answer if you desire it. But I'll also say that, that even though that blank is not going to look the same for each of us, we're not all going to fill that in with the exact same thing. It probably does stem from the same place, which is a place of desire. We are talking a little bit about desire, and desire is not necessarily a bad word. It is not a bad thing. The Bible outlines a whole lot of healthy desires, a, a desire for godliness, a desire for our basic needs to be met, a desire uh, for companionship, a desire for spiritual growth, a desire for Jesus to come back soon. Amen? Yeah. Desire is good. But desire can also be made unholy. Desire can be deadly. We human beings have this way of uh, twisting things selfishly and having intentions that do not line up with good and godly things. And I want you to, to, to think of it this way. If, if ev well, I won't even say if. Think of it this way. Every sinful deed starts with a sinful desire. Every, every sinful thing that we do, every outward action that is sinful, starts with a sinful desire first. Too often our desires are motivated by something we call the comparison trap. We used to call it keeping up with the Joneses, but we've got Joneses here, and I don't want to make them look bad. So we'll just call it the comparison trap. And, and the comparison trap is something where, where we look at someone and say, I want what they have. We compare our lot in life to their lot in life. And, and, and it's really only enhanced by social media today. I mean, it's, we, we're in a culture of self-display, and we get snapshots and, and glimpses of, of other people's lives. And it's really easy to see those things and say, oh, I want that. I want that in my life. I want to have that and really we don't even recognize sometimes what we're seeing sometimes all that we see in those snapshots is one perfect second of a very imperfect day and then we Im we interpret that that perfect sec second into someone who's living a perfect life and we say if only i could have that i want what they have and that becomes our our, our mantra and in a culture of constant self-display the comparison game never ends i mean it's just a continuous thing and our, the people that we compare ourselves to, our comparison targets, uh, are, are usually those that we kind of closely identify with and those who are already in our personal orbits. W many of us don't, uh, some of us don't fixate on, on comparing our lot to that of Elon Musk's because it's, it's just something <laughs> that isn't even attainable for us, right? Uh, uh, but on the flip side, we don't compare our lot a lot of times with, with uh, the homeless guy sp sprawled out in the street. You know, we're not comparing ourselves to that. Rather, we compare our lives to that of our family members and our friends and our colleagues and our neighbors, essentially. We compare our lives to our neighbors. And that comparison, unfortunately, has this really insidious sneaky capability of informing our desires, oftentimes sinfully. And then we become guilty of something that's called coveting. Coveting is what we're talking about today. The final commandment, that's what we're on today. We've spent the last three months studying the Ten Commandments, and we are in the last of God's ten words from Mount Sinai as he directs his people toward right living. And we find this final commandment in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, here is what God says to his people. He says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. 
Now, this is how God wraps up his commandments to his people. And, and it's a little bit strange to see this commandment stacked up with the rest, especially when we looked at that, at that second table of the law, you know, commandments five, five through nine, which are things like don't murder and don't steal and, and don't commit adultery and don't, don't bear false witness. And then we have this, you know, don't, don't covet. Don't covet. They don't even seem to be on, on the same block on a surface level, to be honest. I mean, we have all these serious ones, and we have don't covet. But I like to look at these commandments as a whole. We have to look at them as a whole to understand what it is that God's saying. I mean, what does God begin his commandments with to his people? What does, what does he start with? He, he starts with this. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. That is his first commandment. And then here we have, he ends it with, you shall not covet. And what is very unique about these two commandments, the first commandment and the last commandment, is that they are the only two that cut straight to the heart. They are the only two that cut straight to the heart. God bookends his Ten Commandments with blatant heart issues. All the other commandments certainly have the the inward attitude in mind, in, in view. We can see it as we study them further. But they're all stated and often observed as simply outward actions. This one starts off with the inside. And if God hadn't given us this particular commandment, we might be tempted to think that outward obedience is all that God desires from us. We might be tempted to think that. But this commandment makes explicit what the middle eight commandments only imply, and that's that God requires inward as well as outward obedience from his people. It makes absolutely clear that God judges the heart. God judges the heart. It reminds us that God's law is indeed spiritual. It's spiritual. The commandment about coveting isn't necessarily about what we do, but more about what we desire. And that's what, that's what coveting is, first and foremost. It is a sin of desire. It's a sin of desire. And again, the Bible, the Bible commends desire in its proper place, you know, proper things to desire. But the Bible also talks in very strong terms against sinful desires, against the sin of coveting. God actually really hates coveting. I mean, he hates it. Covetous people are, are, are listed among some of the worst, some of the most vile people. Paul writes in, uh, in Romans, he says, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. That is not a light list of sins. That is not a light list of people. And we find covetousness right smack in the middle of all of that. Paul later goes on in Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians, he says that covetousness must not even be named among you, among the saints. Covetousness should not be a part of your lives, a part of your gathering whatsoever. And then Jesus, Jesus in in the book of Luke, it's recorded as him saying, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. This is no sweet, safe, little sin. This stacks up quite well with the rest. James tells us in his letter, he says that desire gives birth to sin, and sin inevitably leads to death. We have desire, sin, death. Desire leads to sin, sin leads to death. And so there's, this, there's actually two questions that we really need to be asking when it comes to, to, to our desires, and that's, one, what does my heart desire What does my heart desire? And the second question is, where will that desire lead me in the end? Where is that going to lead me? I have just a little bit of experience in counseling people. Um, Not a lot, but I have found, especially with teenagers, especially with teenagers, I found this to be true, that sometimes we have to walk down the path that they're already on to show them the outcome of that of that path. If, if you keep doing what you're doing, you know, here's where you're going to end up. And, and you kind of wish you could have a visual aid like that hardened criminal who comes in and does the, the scared straight talk type thing, but, but I, I, don't, I don't get to do that. 
but sometimes they need to see their future. They need to see their future in order to understand that the path that they're on leads to that future. Do you really want to end up there? And sometimes the answer is no, and they get off that path. And Scripture tells us that covetousness leads to death. That path leads to death, a spiritual death, a separation from God, a separation from God. It leads us away from Him. That's the path of coveting. That's why it's so serious. We're beginning to get a sense of why God included do not covet in His Ten Commandments. And like I said, it's it's an issue of the heart. And this issue of the heart is often expressed in two major ways, two major ways. And as we go through them, I I think you'll begin to see why the natural path of covetousness leads away from God. The first thing is that coveting is an expression of envy. It's an expression of envy. We covet when we want for ourselves what belongs to another. In this sense, it's a little bit different than saying, you know, I wish I had a a, a nicer house or I wish I had a better job. It's saying, I want their house, I want their job, I want the things that they have. Coveting longs for someone else's stuff or their circumstances or their abilities or their gifts or their attributes and, and, and wishing that those were our things, our circumstances, our attributes. And look again at what this commandment says. Look at what God includes here. He says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, wife, servants, ox, donkey, or anything else that is your neighbor's. I think one of the simplest ways that we can view this commandment, the 10th commandment, is as an internalization of the 8th commandment that says you shall not steal. And we have a great example of this. I mean, you know, we've got murder of the heart, which we've considered to be uh, uh, hatred. We've got adultery of the heart, which is lust. We've got theft of the heart, which is covetousness. And we see it real well in in Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7, the Israelites won the battle of Jericho, but they lost the battle of Ai, and they weren't expecting that. They didn't think that was going to happen. Joshua tears his clothes, he's grieving, he's lamenting toward God, and God says, get up, and, and, and reveals to him that somebody in the camp has stolen something that does not belong to them. He has stolen a devoted item, and so Joshua confronts this man, Achan. He says, you know, spill the beans, do not lie to me, what have you done? And so he does. He comes right out and he says, when I saw, when I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them and took them. And that amount, they estimate, is probably somewhere around twenty-five to $30,000 just laying there. I mean, who in their right mind wouldn't think about it? You know, it's just laying there. But this is what he said. He says, when I saw it, Then I coveted it, and then I stole it. Then I stole it. And this means something more than just admiring it. He wasn't admiring this treasure. It means that he wanted it so badly, he was willing to scheme up some plan to make it his own. And when he had what he thought was a workable plan, it informed his actions. He physically took it. That sinful desire that that, that Achan treasured in his heart, heart took control of his will and he acted out on it. Covetousness led to another sin of stealing, right? We see it in the Garden of Eden too. You can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and see this where where Adam and Eve, Eve's looking at that tree. She's looking at that fruit and she coveted the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil before she stole it and before she ate it. She saw that it was good for desire. She desired to have it. We see this unhealthy and sinful and death-inducing desire to have what God did not intend for us to have. And sometimes that desire, if we're not careful, informs our actions. It it informs what we do next. And look at what God specifically mentions in the 10th commandment. There are some things that he very specifically mentions. He says, do not covet your neighbor's house, which most certainly means their physical house, their home, Looking at the punctuation in, in, in the passage, it certainly means that everything that follows, too, the whole household, everything that they have. So then he continues, do not covet your neighbor's wife. Wow, she's so beautiful. I wish my wife looked like that. I wish I had a wife like that. I, I, I wish my wife aged like her or cooked like her or whatever. 
last year I was reading this article and, and I, I ended up having to watch the video. I, it just, it, I, there was so much curiosity in me. There's this pastor from Missouri who made the news in a very, very bad way. He spent a portion of his sermon addressing the women in the congregation. And he basically says, women, if you want your husbands to be happy, if you want to keep your husbands happy, you need to do a little better job looking like Melania Trump. (laughs) Oh, yeah. The guys who aren't even married knows that was wrong. (laughs) And it was was an awful thing to say. It was an awful thing to to think. And it's, it's, it's encouraging that these men covet another man's wife. And, and yet, yeah, I do believe he was fired once that clip hit the national news. And the reverse is also true. This isn't just true of, of, of men toward women. It's true for women toward men. And I'm going to add this. This restriction is not limited to people that we, that we see in real life. Sometimes it applies to those that we also see on our screens on our phones and computers and TVs, whatever we have. Our eyes are sometimes really distracted by counterfeit people. I'm going to tell you a story. In, in 1973, a Nobel Prize was awarded to Dr. Nico Tinbergen for his research about animal and human behavior. And for about 30 years, he studied different animals, different insects, and he studied people, and he wanted to, to, to show how natural behaviors were triggered by visual stimuli. And so he and this other doctor, Dr. Magnus, they played a trick on butterflies. After figuring out which marks on female butterflies were the most eye-catching for their male counterparts, they created their own butterflies, cardboard butterflies, and they painted them to look like what they called super females. And their patterns, the patterns on their wings were based on the, on, on the same thing that you would find on a female butterfly, a real one, but with more exciting marks. There were several more exciting marks and, and things that you would never find in nature. They were not natural marks. So they had these real female butterflies and they had these cardboard ones set up in an area to observe and then they release all these male butterflies out into this area and they're observing, they're watching what happens and every single male butterfly was tricked. Every single one of them. They had all these, f- these, these real female butterflies, and yet the male butterflies kept going to the cardboard ones. They liked what they were seeing in these cardboard ones. And they just kept after the fake ones, even though the real ones were around and were available. And, and even when they weren't getting what they really wanted, they stuck with the cardboard ones, which was so strange. And what was alarming is that they found that the human mind is very similar to that. Very similar. It works in the same way. It is susceptible to the same tricks. Butterflies get confused by cardboard. Humans get confused by pixels on a screen. And it's particularly harmful for human beings because we then expect the real thing to look like the counterfeit. And this is not not how we love our spouse. This is coveting another's. Next, Jesus, Jesus says, God says, do not covet your neighbor's servants. And in many cultures, having servants means that you're doing very, very well in your life. You can afford to have these people, right? This goes back to the whole comparison trap where we judge our own success by how we think we stack up to others, to other people. I mean, I've got friends who, or acquaintances at least, who have nannies or they have these, these lawn care professionals at their house every week and all these. And I think, man, it would be so nice to afford that and I have to, I have to guard my heart a little bit and, and say, don't covet what they have, don't covet what they have, just chalk it up to must be nice and move on. <laughs> don't cover, covet, don't covet your neighbor's ox or donkey, which sounds strange to us. We don't typically look at our neighbor's donkeys, but in that economy of that day, these animals represented someone's livelihood. This was their livelihood. Someone who had several oxen, strong oxen, they could, they could plow and they could harvest far more crops than someone who didn't have those things. Someone who had a lot of donkeys, they were seen as a rich man. If you have a lot of donkeys, donkeys were used by merchants a lot of times. And, and, and these guys who had a lot of donkeys, they would make even more money off of their donkeys by renting them out to other people. And so they were, just, they were doing quite well. And, and coveting these work animals at that time meant coveting that person's livelihood, me, meant being dissatisfied with your own livelihood. And today that may... That may look a lot like coveting someone else's work equipment or tractor or, or 
job or vehicle or income, anything that has to do with the person's livelihood. And then I love this one. Do not covet anything. Do not covet anything that is your neighbor's. This statement closes every last loophole that you and I might try to find in this commandment. There is no loophole. It covers all possessions. It covers all situations. It covers all circumstances, all gifts, all abilities, everything. Everything. We are forbidden to covet anything at all that is our neighbor's. And all of these things should be able to show us, at least a little bit, that coveting is a violation of what Jesus considered a second great commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We talked about how that relates to the second table of, uh, of the law. Coveting means that you are failing to love your neighbor as yourself. I love what Kevin DeYoung wrote about this. He says, when we're covetous, we think only, or at least supremely, of what is good for us, what we would like, what would make us happy, and what could make our lives better, regardless of how others are affected. And I'm willing to bet that you and I have seen this on display more times than, than what we even realize. I mean, if you've ever served in the nursery or spent any time at all with a couple of kids at the same time, you're, I guarantee you've recognized coveting because there is nothing that arouses a child's interest in a toy more than having another child holding that toy. And you know it. I mean, all this, this kid's playing with something, they see another kid playing with it, and all of a sudden, wait a minute, I want that. I want that, and then there's a fight. Or how about Christmas morning? And I hope this is not just a Sadler tradition. This is the way it was in my house. Sometimes I recognize this a little bit in our house now. But, but Christmas morning, kids wake up, they open their presents, they're very, very happy until they see what their siblings got and think, wait a minute, I like that better than what I got. Or, you know, if you were like me at all, you start to calculate, okay, how much did this cost my parents compared to what they spent on me? And things don't quite add up, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you, Christmas morning turns into cries of, it's not fair, it's not fair, and it takes the whole joy out of it, and you're like, all right, cool, I kept the receipts, we'll return it all, it doesn't matter. Or it starts that, you know, there are kids in Africa type lecture, you know, you got to go that route. <laughs> I remember those. As easily, as easily as we can see selfishness in kids, sometimes we are blind to our own. Sometimes we, we just ignore it. We don't notice it. We notice, honestly, we notice other people's things with all the righteous indignation of kids on Christmas morning. We covet when we want for ourselves what belongs to another. Coveting is not only theft of the heart, though. That's not, envy is not the only way that this is expressed. Coveting is, coveting is also expressed in, it's an expression of discontentment. It's an expression of discontentment. The Tenth Commandment forbids all discontentment with our own estate. That's what the Westminster Shorter Catechism would tell us. The Tenth Commandment forbids all discontentment with our own estate. And they say that Christian contentment really is the rare jewel of life. It's a rare jewel of life. It's hard to find, although we certainly have the, the capacity and the capability to, to, at every moment, I should say, to be content and I love what Paul writes about contentment. Paul is a very content man. I, Paul's attitude in all of his letters is just incredible. But he says this, he says, For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We can see, just by Paul's words, that contentment is not limited to a particular tax bracket. He says, high or low, plenty or little, we ought to be content with the lot that we've been given. Now, our previous point on envy showed that violating the 10th commandment is also a violation of what Jesus calls the second, second great law, right? That we fail to love our, our neighbors when we covet what they have. That's what we're learning there. And, and here, I wish to show you that that violating the 10th commandment here, being covetous, is also a violation of, of the first table of law, the law and, and the first great commandment that, that Jesus gives. Loving the Lord your God with all your, all your heart, your soul, and your might. When we covet, we express in our hearts that we believe God still owes us something. 
It's impossible to covet. It is impossible to covet and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might. The first commandment and the tenth commandment are absolutely related in the fact that they are heart issues, but here we see them, we see them come together just a little bit more, a little bit more intimately. God tells us first in his first commandment that we are to worship him alone. We're to worship him alone, and then he closes his commandments by telling us that he is all that we need. He is everything. He says, I'm all that you need. Don't turn to other gods. Don't turn to statues. Don't turn to animals or or abilities or treasures. Let nothing else capture your gaze and your affections ahead of me. There are no other gods. Worship me. Be content with what I have provided. Be content with what I have provided. And remember the original context of these words that God is speaking, these these Ten Commandments. He's talking to a nation, a people who spent roughly 400 years in captivity, in slavery, and now they're on this long journey to a land that God has promised them, and they have worried. They have worried about their direction that they're going. They've worried about their food. They've worried about their safety. And God is saying, I've given you I have given you what I have intended on giving you for this time, and it's enough. It's enough. And sometimes we need to hear that. Sometimes we need to hear it. Contentment is the antidote to coveting. It's the antidote. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Clever man, that Paul, when he wrote this. Clever man. See what he's doing here. I mean, we, we think of coveting as being something about gain. That's why we covet. I want to gain these things. And yet, he's flipping it around and saying, godliness with contentment is great gain. God's saying, I, I want you to have gain. I do. I want to bless you. But you won't get it by coveting. You will get it through contentment. How genius How genius that God has placed himself at both ends, both ends of the Ten Commandments, his ten words to his people. When we, when God is first, when God is first in our hearts, which is what the first commandment communicates to us, where he should be, then we are content with his provision, which is what this commandment is communicating to us. How could we ever be upset with what the God of the universe has provided for us, what he has given us? How could we ever be upset with that? And lastly, since the, ten, since the Tenth Commandment is indeed a heart issue and not something that typically uh, is an outward issue, it is a little bit harder to diagnose. Heart issues are always a little bit harder to diagnose. So we ask the questions, you know, how do, how do I know if I'm coveting? How do you know when you're, when you're being covetous? What does it look like? What are some of the outward manifestations of this inward heart condition? And just real quick, I want to I suggest four signs four signs to watch for that really are quite telling that you or I have a coveting problem. And and I got this from a great book called The Ten Commandments. But he says, you might be coveting if, (laughs) I just realized it sounds like a Jeff Foxworthy thing. You might be a redneck if. (laughs) You might be coveting if, if you've hurt others in order to get more for yourself. That's a sign of coveting. Do whatever it takes to get ahead. That's the mentality, right? Numero uno, that's me. This is a very clear violation of the 10th commandment and is very clearly not loving your neighbor. The second thing, you might be coveting if you're preoccupied with making and accumulating more. There was this pastor who who just, he wrote a confession one day and he says, I belong to the cult of the next thing. It's dangerously easy to get enlisted. It happens by default. Not by choosing the cult, but by failing to resist it. It has its own litany of sacred words. More, you deserve it. New, faster, cleaner, brighter. And the cult of the next thing's central message proclaims, crave and spend, for the kingdom of stuff is here. And it's not unlike a parable that Jesus told the parable of the four soils, where we see that there's a seed that lands in this thorny soil, and, and, and it originally, it starts to bear fruit, only to be choked out by, by, by the weeds, by the thorns. And, and Jesus says, that's, that's the, the, the lie of riches and the worry of this life. 
And Jesus doesn't tell us that the people he's talking about there made this conscious decision to turn away from God. They just, they got distracted. They got distracted by being too busy. Distracted with lesser matters. And if you find yourself in this place, in the thorny soil or in the cult of the next thing, you're covetous. That's the truth. The third thing, you might be coveting if you're unwilling to give up what you already have. That's a tough one because some of us aren't interested in, in bigger and better. That doesn't appeal to us. We're fine with where we're at, but we don't want to give up anything that we have. We don't want to lose any security, any status whatsoever. That may be a sign of, of coveting. And for your frequently or you frequently grumble about your house, your spouse, or your lot in life. I want you to think of it in, this, in, in these terms. There's this old poem. I have no idea who wrote this. But he starts off, he says, It was spring, but it was summer I wanted, the warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall I wanted, the colorful leaves and the cool dry air. It was fall, but it was winter I really wanted, the beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday season. It was winter, but it was spring I wanted, the warmth and the blossoming of nature. And he goes on to list more things, and by the end of it, the poet says, I never got what I wanted. No matter our lot in life, it's easy to want something different. Sometimes coveting seems to just draw from us growing old of the things that we have. We just need a change. We want something different. Your frequent grumbling of these things may be an expression of your discontentment in life and therefore may be an expression of coveting. Now, church, we just wrapped up our 10-word series. We have now gone through all 10 commandments. The last three months have been devoted to the 10 commandments, and I hope, I hope that you have been as challenged as I have been in this. I have been incredibly challenged in, in, in studying this and, and preaching this. I hope that we each see the importance of godliness and obedience, both inward and outward obedience. I hope that, that more so we've each been reminded of our need for a Savior because we are not perfect people. We could not fulfill this law, but Jesus did. Christ has. So we are in need of, of His grace. And I hope that maybe some blind spots have been removed from some of us. I hope we've seen the connection of God's words and the Ten Commandments to Jesus' words and, and what He considers to be the two greatest, which sums up all the Ten Commandments, sums up the entire law. And I hope that you see just how important this final commandment truly is and how it connects to the first commandment about worshiping God alone. May God be, our, may, may God be the fixation of our gaze. May we take joy in His provision. May we find the rare jewel of Christian contentment in this life. And I'm just going to close with this one verse. I think it sums it up quite well. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. May this be our heart's desire. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you for your word. Thank you for your ten words, your ten commandments that you have, have given us to live by and, and, and given us so that we may know you better and understand what it is that you desire from your people better. And Lord, thank you for loving us enough to show us and direct us toward godly living. And even more so, thank you for, for loving us enough to provide a Savior in the midst of our failures. Thank you for, for loving us that much. Lord, may we look at this 10th commandment as seriously as we do the rest. You do not waste your breath on little unimportant things, Lord. Let us see how coveting affects our relationship with you, how it affects our relationships with other people. And, and Lord, just make us mindful and empower us to live holy. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen.